I welcome you to join my journey in learning quantum computing. In this video, I will cover some basic differences between classical computers and quantum computers. From a physics point of view, computers we are using daily are known as classical computers, and they operate by bits. A bit is a single binary digit which is either 0 or 1. But what is 0 and 1? Here's an example. If you hire an accountant, and you ask them to calculate your company's return on asset, they can complete the task simply by dividing your company's net income by total assets. You provide input information, the accountant does some math, and gives you some outputs. You see, computer is no different. A computer also accepts tasks and performs logical operations. However, the input information in a computer is represented by a series of zeros and ones. And here's how it works. In the heart of any electronic device, such as a computer or a mobile phone, you can find a processor. A processor consists of billions of transistors. Transistors are made out of silicon, the most abundant element on Earth after oxygen. Silicon has four electrons in its outer layer. Atoms of silicon form what is known as a covalent band. With its four valence electrons, it can either donate or share these electrons, and this property makes silicon a semiconductor. Semiconductors can conduct electricity better than insulators, but not as good as metals. One can change the mobility of electrons in silicon with a process called doping. If you dope silicon with boron, for instance, you are left with one hole, because boron has one less electron in the outer shell. The silicon electrons in the valence band fill the holes and become mobile, and we say, Positive holes move in the opposite direction to the movement of the electrons across the crystal. This is known as p-type semiconductor, where p stands for positive. If you dope silicon with phosphorus, you are left with one extra electron, because phosphorus has one more electron in the outer shell, and that extra electron can travel across the crystal. This is known as n-type semiconductor, and n, as you have guessed, stands for negative. A transistor consists of p-type and n-type semiconductors that are connected to electric wires known as source and drain. Electrons and holes at the boundary combine and cancel one another, leaving a depletion zone, where no electric charge flows. This is when the transistor is in off state, or zero. A transistor acts like a switch, but instead of an actual switch, there is another element called gate. The role of gate is to apply a small positive current that attracts some of the electrons from the p-type semiconductor, making some room for electrons to move from one side of n-type semiconductor to another one. This is when transistor is in on state or one state. You've probably heard of logical gates such as AND and OR gates that operate on one or more binary inputs to produce a single binary output. Quantum computers operate with qubits, and they can be 0, 1, or both. Qubit can be anything that exhibits quantum behavior, an electron, a photon, or a nucleus of an atom. Electrons have magnetic moment, which is similar to a bar magnet. When placed in a magnetic field, they will align themselves with field lines. Since electrons are quantum mechanical objects, they can be in 0, or 1, or both states at the same time. This is called superposition. This means right before you measure qubit, it has to decide which state it's going to be at. So long as a qubit is not observed, we can't tell which state it has, but once it's measured, it can collapse in one of two states, and the measured result is in the form of probabilities. Interestingly, two qubits are entangled, which means by measuring just one entangled qubit, you can directly deduce the properties of another one. Two qubits in your computer can be in four possible states, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, or 1, 1, but only one of them at any time. This limits the computer to processing one output at a time, like trying to solve a maze problem. You can only go through each path once. In a quantum computer, two qubits can also have four states. The difference is, because of superposition, the qubits can represent all four states at the same time. That's a bit like having four classical computers running in parallel. 
if you add more bits to a classical computer, it can still only deal with one state at a time. But as you add qubits, the power of your quantum computer grows exponentially. And we can say that if you have n qubits, you can simultaneously represent 2 to the n states. If you google a quantum computer, you end up with these results. Don't expect to have one of these as a personal computer, at least for near future. These machines require huge facilities and specific condition to run. Quantum chips have to operate at very low temperatures to maintain the quantum information. That's why the temperature inside most quantum computers is below negative 450 degrees Fahrenheit, and they are kept in what is called dilution refrigerators. You see, quantum computers are not meant to replace classical computers. They are just meant to solve distinct problems that are hard to solve with classical computers, such as optimization problems and simulating quantum effects. According to IBM research, this iron sulfide cluster in nitrogenous enzyme is the biggest cluster that we can simulate with the most powerful supercomputer, probably took months. It should take a quantum computer to simulate the same enzyme within minutes. More details on quantum mechanics will come in future videos. If you enjoyed this video, please make sure to subscribe to my channel and hit the notification bell. In the next video, we will make a new IBM account and we will learn how to access IBM quantum computer. So stay tuned and have a good time.